what I really like about your film, it's, it seems very simple, but it's actually very precise and very detailed. Um, specifically the, the dialogue, the mise-en-scène, um, everything, the way it's shot. So can you maybe start talking about um, when you start about the writing about the film? Are you process well, the, uh, starts? The first scene that I wrote for this film was the scene in which uh, Mark returns and kicks Mike out of the apartment. And I was kind of thinking of a sp very specific character trait of Mike and how this would kind of come into conflict with a very specific character trait of Mark. Uh, who are people I know, friends of mine who live in Philadelphia and New Jersey, and and then kind of how these would butt heads and where things would go from there. And then I thought, oh, Mike would go to Marta's, because Marta is someone I knew who was very welcoming and would, would just sort of allow someone to come into their apartment without necessarily asking too many questions, I think. Or maybe, uh, <laughs> you could ask her, she's here. Um, and, uh, and then it kind of, and then I was thought, well, something should come before Mark returns, and so it went from there. But it was always thinking of, and this is all sort of this general kind of schematic thing was kind of uh, filled in by uh, various anecdotal stories that happened to friends of mine, the people who appear in the film that they would tell me about, occasionally things from my own life that I would throw in there. Um, but it was, yeah, sort of collecting details to fill in a, a theme. So you work with non-actors, yeah. but you direct them very precisely. Um, yeah, we, we usually uh, do a couple of rehearsals with beforehand with scenes that mm -hmm. are uh, either end up being in the film after being extensively rewritten or are never in the film, but it's usually just to get people used to um, reciting lines that you know, are often written by me or it's them kind of retelling a story of their own that they told me. and. Um, it's usually just gets to the point of being comfortable with doing this since it's not a natural thing to do, but uh, not to the point where it's feeling kind of casual or anything, but we talk about you know, intonation, a word to stress or to not stress, a pause that they would do sporadically in the uh, rehearsal that I liked and would ask them to do it again conscientiously and these kinds of things. And then movement would be something that was kind of improvised day of, but we would talk about that very precisely beforehand uh, and rehearse it. And so forth. Well, so. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned like retelling stories because you use this specifically in the film also. Yes, there's um. a, obviously there's Cal who's retelling these stories about becoming a Catholic and uh, the, the Buddhist monk and the, explaining the, the, the Italian card game, the Sicilian card game Scopa. And these are things that I had, you know, he had told me at some point and then I noted for later that he should recount these for the camera because they're <laughs> incredible. And um, and I hope that you know whatever my fascination was with them comes through to you. Uh, there's also even more anecdote or incidental things like when Mar uh, Marta's roommate Meg is recounting this dirt drop at the theater that she works at. That was just sort of in the script. Probably said like Mar Meg talks about her day, and then the day of we went we brainstormed a number of things that recently happened to her at work, and that was one of the things that stuck out to me. So. Well, there's also the hockey scene where uh, when when he starts the tour at the beginning, yeah. he's explaining the ice cream <laughs> cake yes, thing the and Bobby trying Clark to be telling it. So that's also specifically in the film. Yes, yeah. it's, it's this was something funny. that I had gone on this tour that my friend was giving. Uh, Mark uh, runs a tour company like the one in the film. And uh, this was, I guess, only on their very first one few tours that that story was actually told. And they eventually cut it out, I think, for it's obscurity, uh, <laughs> maybe, yes, Mark? Yes, um, but I thought it was, I luckily was there when they were still doing it. I was there then and, and had to put it in the film. It's too so good. that's a true story? Yes, right? Yeah. Well, if it's not true, it's, it's a true perfect. Story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not true when Mike's telling it, obviously, <laughs> but. He did his best. <laughs> um, also, something else that I'm sure everybody's um, asking you about, it's your shoot and film, and it's the only film in the festival that's also projected on film. So can you talk about your need to work for you in, on celluloid as opposed to like digital, which is becoming... Well, uh, I had always uh, seen things projected this way, and I didn't see it necessarily any reason to not do it like that. Um, and it was, I think it just goes back to I, uh, 
this discovery of this particular kind of shooting on 16 and presenting it on 35 that I had this kind of uh, format that I had discovered when I was in high school and Killer Sheep was re-released. I saw this in Philadelphia and then discovered other 16 to 35 uh, prints uh, when I was seeing films like Wanda and uh, Rivette and Romare's 16 to 35 millimeter films, which for me only exist as like that specific uh, operation. And uh, I don't know, you can still do this and I figured I would still do it. Um, so. Well, talking <laughs> about Romare, mm -hmm. Your movie make me think a lot about Romare. I mean, the way it shot, the, the obviously the format, but also the sound. Mm -hmm. So is that some well someone that you would I think? think I like that the movie has a very um, rough and jagged, scrappy quality, which I think is something that one gets from Romare after he spends this like period of time in the '70s making like finessed, luxurious 35 millimeter films, and then just like is the only person in the history of cinema ever just like throw it, reject this kind of professional way of making films and just go back to making like less than movies with like a less than 10 person crew and that are very, um, yeah, rough. And I, and I wanted this and any, you know, we had, um, yeah, the movies all direct sound for the most part mixed, but it's the location sound and this has a particular quality to it uh, that, you know, a movie with a more post-produced soundtrack would not have. Uh, the lighting is basically what is available at the location, boosted a bit with practicals or china balls. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's more about uh, kind of being open to various accidental and unexpected things that could happen while you're shooting. And so if you're not putting a whole lot into the into the situation, you can allow for that to happen. Like for example, in the very first shot, I like, like quite like, it only happens a few times, it's not very flashy and it's not underlined by the filmmaking, but there's these like cars that were driving by uh, that were reflecting light on the wall, across the back wall, and it happens like two times, I think, in the take that's in the film. Um, and maybe there are a few other takes where it happened a bit more frequently, but this is something that it just happened because we were there on a very bright morning and cars driving by and, and there was nothing preventing how this would happen. There was nothing blocking the windows or anything. And, it's just something that happened, so. <laughs> um, you've directed several short films, including one that was a new director last year, so you graduated to feature, and so it's a short feature, it's a feature. Uh, can you talk about the uh, location? Uh, all your films are set roughly in the same um, geographical neighborhood. Yes, uh, well I made a short film a few years ago called Broken Specs, which has the same uh, lead actor, Mike, and I had become fascinated with him around that time, and then made a film there with like a small crew and this group of people who were there were very willing to be in my films. Uh, friends from high school, some people who I became acquainted with through them and hadn't known before, and sort of as we made each short film, and I, having liked doing it like this, I wanted to do it again, so I made two more films like that. And um, we just wanted to continue working like that. It's very easy if you have this kind of production model that you know, you have a, a three or four person crew and then a group of people who are willing to both give you their time uh, very generously and let you use bits of their lives to uh, create the film and the story. And so it's a whole system that worked out through the short films and then I it was in place and we could do a longer film like that, so. Do you always want to work like in New Jersey, Philadelphia, is that like? I don't know, it's just, uh, it's not something, I, I guess, well there's, uh, no, no, the thought isn't, I guess, I want to work in this particular place, but I can't not make the films in this particular place because that's where the people who inspire the films are, so. Uh, and it's a, I don't know, it's a great place practically, like you can shoot in bars without having to be charged elaborate amounts of money as you would in New York and you can shoot on the street basically without issue, uh, I guess if you're our kind of crew, I mean you could do that in New York too, but, but I like the architecture and the, these kind of streets which have, I don't know, like that crab shop, you could not film that in New York, this is incredible, that thing would be knocked down in a second. Uh, so, and it's just been like that for years, I think, uh, this, this un, out of business crab place on uh, Washington <laughs> Avenue, which is the, it's interesting because that's like the historical marker boundary, I think, between like South Philadelphia and a bit of a more affluent neighborhood above it or a less Italian neighborhood. Um, and you see him crossing it twice, twice he's on his way to and from, to South Philadelphia, so. Uh, I'd like to talk about the climax uh, 
of the film, which is the fight scene. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a little bit more about the creation of this? That scene <laughs> was always there, though I think I wrote the dialogue for that the morning of. Um, and I just, I, I liked, obviously these guys, there's, a, there's this character who is so kind of under the surface hostile to Mike, not straightforwardly hostile, but definitely, and you kind of just see that the moment this like glint of the hostility come through, but in a way where he doesn't really pose much of a threat to him, but somehow this is uh, like the greatest threat to Mike, I guess, so he runs away and has a hot dog um, <laughs> to, to I mean, grasp, get a grasp of himself or something, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I like that scene also because uh, we, then staged like we shot like another scene immediately after it that has almost the same staging, and I just I don't know. There's something nice about that, but yeah. Did, did, you, sh yeah. did you shot in sequence or? No, no it was all out of sequence okay. just because everyone has. I didn't want anyone to have to like take off of work for the movie. The only person who took off work was Mike because he had to be there all the time. But everyone else, I was trying to as much as I could work it around mm -hmm. their schedule. So it was a lot of out of sequence, okay. Okay. just so no one would have to lose money on my account, which is not be <laughs> worth it. Can you talk uh, a little more about your other like, movie influences outside of Romare? Uh, you, you, your movies are very episodic, so is there like, more filmmaker that you would like to talk well, about? Well, I, no, I don't know that there's like, anyone in particular mm -hmm. I'm thinking about as much as just, I've, I'm just collecting scenes that eventually c suggest, there's like some kind of organization there and then I'm collecting scenes to add that and then what details from people's lives I'm bringing in changes the direction of the film in a subtle ways or in really significant ways, depending on what's available to me or what people bring to it, uh, sometimes day of, sometimes in advance. Um, so, no, it just, it came up uh, that there would just be, I don't know, like the Liz character, for example, was there would be like this section where this girl shows up and that went through so many different stages. Uh, eventually gets sort of getting pared down to this girl who just sort of is present, uh, that he's not pursuing at all, but is like, it could, would in, a, in a different movie would be like a romantic interest or something, but in this movie, obviously, this guy who, who although he's always saying yes to every interaction almost that he's in, and always is just going along with whatever happening, he doesn't, he's not like pursuing anything in particular, so he wouldn't pursue this girl beyond something very uh, platonic or surfacey and couldn't maybe, and it's, and it's like ambiguous. It doesn't, you know, who knows if he's like aware that, that uh, he could uh, pursue her in a romantic way or if that's not even a thought that crosses his mind and he's just trying to be, do sort of like normal, normative behavior to uh, fit in or something. You know, you know I, I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's just there to be considered, I guess. And Poland? Poland. It's, it's, well, because Mark has spent exotic. lots of time in Eastern Europe. Oh. Uh, <laughs> he worked there for a bit, and and that was so. Yeah, that's just a detail from from Mark that that uh, would allow him also to tell that story uh, about when he was in Poland, even though he's referencing KFC. That does in fact happen in Poland. <laughs> it's unusual. I mean, it's an international you know. company. <laughs> Uh, it's very, yes. <laughs> That's, well, I don't know, I wanted something, uh, you know, very abrupt. I mean, it's my friend Rob, uh, who's the hockey scene. Why was it so abrupt? Uh, well, I wanted everything in the movie to be as, ab as, as abrupt as possible, and that sort of came back to haunt me later when I sort of wanted it to be a little less abrupt. But the idea was that he would have this friend, this acquaintance. In the beginning of the movie, it's just showing you various acquaintances and people he runs into and so forth and setting up that portrait of his life. But he... Uh, I've always been wanting to film my friend Rob's playing hockey, uh, so it was an opportunity to do that, and that he would just be this guy who there would be some unspoken disagreement that it could have been the most benign thing or it could be the worst thing in the world that happened between them. Mike doesn't think it's that big of a deal, so he can show up to watch his friend play hockey, but this guy would never in a million years want to see him again, and so it tells him that. And so it's a good thing he didn't show up with the girl, I think. He's the only one in the stadium. <laughs> yeah, and that's how it is if you go to those hockey games. It's this adult hockey league at the University of Pennsylvania class of 1920 rink. <laughs> 20, right? Or 1929? I think it's 1920. 
Yeah, you don't know. I don't know. There was and I can see oh. that too, because he's not necessarily going out of his way to necessarily help anyone else. He's, if, if you are in that situation, just sort of going along with things, maybe he passively screwed Rob at some point. <laughs> there was a question there. Yes, this is my sound guy, Sean Dunn, and uh, Sage is the camera person. He's the, they're the most important collaborators I have, uh, and the people that one turns to after the takes to see if, they, if they're uh, on board with how the things went during the take. Um, and Sage is always willing to work with the very few resources I want to give him um, that kind of push us into corners where we have very few creative decisions left. Um, I think this is a good quality and in him. And, uh, and then Sean is a, a guy who's willing to work with you know, direct location sound and record it very well with one mic or several mics. Uh, yeah, and he's a guy who I, whose opinions I, who I trust uh, more than anyone else. So that's why I want to work with him. <laughs> well, I think. No, I think they're different. I think because if there are characters in the movies that come out of a kind of like a behavioral composite and they're, it's only within the context of the movie that you would see that behavior across various scenes. Um, and so, you know, it's not like, they're not open books talking about themselves like in Romare, which would be the difference, I guess. Those are people who just like, as soon as you meet them, they're just like telling you their whole entire history is very theatrical. But these are, you know, it's just, it's just how they act within one scene to the next very differently sometimes. And so I think it's like defined on a film by film basis. Maybe it's the same Rob as in Travel Plans, I don't know. <laughs> but um, so yeah, I mean they're similar only in, in the sense that obviously I'm working with their own biographical details. And, but I think each film has its own context. So for me they're different. Uh, and, um, and that just comes out of what scenes make it into each film. And that kind of creates different characters that way. Um, yes. So you're worried he's going to run out of inspiration from his friends? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, at least not for this film. I don't know. Uh, and for the film I'm now working on, it's, uh, it's not the case. Um, no, I don't think that people people? have become too... No. Uh, I mean, that would be a question for Mark and Dan and Marta, who are all here, and Cal, uh, who are all present tonight. Um, but uh, not in my experience. There. I mean, because Mark and Dan, Marta, Mike, everyone, like, they don't have a life, life in film or anything. They're just, um, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, not so far, I guess I can say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And working on another film, which actually will have a lot of different people in it um, who have not been in any of these films before. Are you stealing from them too? I've been <laughs> informing the characters based on their uh, experiences, yes. <laughs> so they all get credited at the end for yeah. um, everything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they should. I think, like, I, I would, I credit them. I think, like, I'm only taking, like, a story credit. I think I, I mean, the next movie might not even have end credits on it because I think, I don't know, I'm f f fed up with these kinds of conventions. But, uh, but uh, yeah. It's it's uh, there's no dialogue credit for me. Even I mean, there's, I mean it's a mix. It's it's so hard to say because there's a lot of dialogue that I'm writing. There's a lot of dialogue I'm taking from them and incorporating into pre-existing dialogue. And uh, yeah, so it's a mix. But we'll see. At least not. Yeah, no, <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. We're not really worried. I think <laughs> we're just teasing you a little bit. I'd be worried, but I'd, uh, when it encounters, when I encounter it, it will be interesting okay. to see what happens. Is there any but other convention that uh, you want to get rid of, as opposed to just end credits? Oh, the uh, beginning titles too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think you just walk into the thing. It's like been going for it could be going for three hours, and you just mm -hmm. walked in, or it could have just started. And maybe yeah. the next one will be a loop. I don't know. I was going to say it would be just a loop. <laughs> uh, there was someone there in the back. Bearing the back, yeah. Uh, I 
wanted these kinds of things to be, um, I'm obviously like emphasizing those moments by choosing to put them in the film uh, instead of other things that I could. But yeah, I mean, in terms of the way the dialogue is decided, it's not with a particular thing in mind of like revealing about human nature. It's more just um, uh, trying to, as best I can, allow the uh, speech patterns and the kind of natural speech patterns of people to be shown without, and their accents and so forth, without them kind of putting up a screen of um, an interpretation of the character. Um, which is why we don't really talk about psychology in the, in the rehearsals. It's just like, you read this in a way that wasn't interp adding an interpretation or a nuance here or there that was because you would have interpreted it in a certain way. It was just a kind of flat reading without putting anything in. But through that way, we can therefore hear like, you would naturally pause this particular moment as opposed to there um, without thinking about it and trying to capture those particular things. But then to then emphasize them is to add, I guess, another layer of, I mean, that's the performance, I guess. but. Um, it's not done with anything premeditated in mind as, as in terms of uh, the whole process is to try to see these things that I wouldn't necessarily have seen otherwise without making the film, if that makes any sense. <laughs> there was somewhere else. Oh, yeah. yeah, thank you. This is... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, what kind of, what kind of, uh, where will things go if, if, if that, if these particular qualities of Mike's character were to be put into situations with particular characteristics of other people? So, then we find out. <laughs> okay, so we have time for a couple more questions. You there? No, no, there were no subtitles. They like couldn't figure out anyone to subtitle 35, so they didn't show with subtitles. So you but my friend English who or? watched the film at the premiere, mm -hmm. I did not watch the film, but my friend who did, said that there was a woman next to him talking the whole time, and about midway through he realized that she was sort of frantically translating the whole thing for her neighbor. So I think <laughs> and she was into it. Uh, so that's, there are at least people like that if they did not understand uh, the, German, the English. But uh, evidently it somehow passed through German ears decently. For but, the most part. But German is a complicated language. But they also, so a lot of them speak in English. Through. Yeah. To some degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> and there was someone there? Um, you're trying to bring up other literary references. Uh, no. no uh, uh, Joyce is not an influence on the film. Uh, I can see where you're going with this. Um, <laughs> But uh, I have not read Finnegan's Wake, but I like Ulysses. Uh, I don't want to go on too long of a tangent about what I like about Ulysses, as I've, been, as I've done elsewhere regarding Herman Melville. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> and there, were, there was one question there or so. Yeah. Mike will be here on Tuesday. He could not get off from his job tonight, uh, but he'll be here on Tuesday. So come and see him. Okay. What's his job? He works at an Acme now. He was working at a pizza place when we started writing the film, oh. hence the pizza place. But then he quit the job prior to shooting the film. And then, um, which actually, it was a good thing because we were going to shoot in this other pizza place where he had worked. He didn't feel comfortable going back to that place. <laughs> and that place didn't have a particularly like American pizza place interior. Whereas I think this place does it, with these like plastic booths and green and reddish, uh, vel or not velvet, uh, like leather thing. Uh, cushions and so forth and fluorescent lighting and like green tube lighting things around the edge and so it was, a, it was, it was he quit it, it was not good for him but it was allowed us to get a better location I think for the movie and the guys who run that place are incredible they were making us pizzas left and right for free for some reason and and you even dropped one on the floor yeah that and they, then they gave us more boxes because the boxes destroyed at that point but well thank you so much it was thank really you. great to share the film tonight Thank you.